All right, so we finally made it to the sixth floor. We did. It's, it's the <laughs> chief's office is on the sixth floor, not the fourth floor. No, and and we we didn't know which floor it was. Uh, it is nice to be in the chief's office. This is the first time I've ever been up here. And as we said, normally uh, Wheeler's downstairs in the lockup. In processing. But, but <laughs> nevertheless, <clears throat> this is me, first right. time. This is my first time up here. Wow. Okay. I never got an invite. And that's okay. Well, well, welcome. Welcome to the sixth floor. <laughs> Let's talk about that. Chief Garcia is with us here. Uh, Eddie Garcia, the Dallas police chief. Uh, chief, thanks for being on the podcast here with us. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. You're two years in now, right? Yeah, a little bit two years in. Yeah. anniversary. Yeah. Hey, normally we have a Texas craft beer. <laughs> You've been here a couple of years. What's your favorite Texas craft beer? Do you have, you have a favorite yet? I don't have a favorite yet. Good. I'm I don't usually, either. I usually. Yeah. What do you I, like? What, what do you drink? What's the go-to for? Uh, the go-to is probably a uh, uh, little Tito's and diet. Nice. There you That's go. the go-to. Yeah, get straight to it then. Huh? It makes me nervous when you ask him what his favorite one is because I, I people ask that to me too. But and when I, I drink I never beer, have an idea. I'll say this: when I drink beer, there's two, right? So I'll uh, like a Michelob Ultra. Okay, that's a, that's a good easy cutting those calories. calories. Cutting those calories. calories huh? Got to watch those, right? And I tell you what: the one I started uh, drinking a little bit this year, when you can find it, is eight beer. Eight, eight beer. Yeah, Troy Aikman's beer. Oh yeah, we haven't had that. Yeah, That's a challenge for us. Yeah, okay. the beauty of it, it has one gram of protein. A little known fact: oh, it's like one gram of protein in that beer. Okay, so some 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 yeah, healthy. We're gonna yeah. have to have, have to do that. Let, let's get down to uh, why we're here because I know you have a busy calendar, uh, Chief. Let, for people who may not have realized what's been going on, um, a couple of years ago, mm -hmm. Dallas had no crime plan. This is yeah. before you got here. Um, we had to have state troopers come in and patrol the streets. That made a lot of news in Dallas. Things changed at the Dallas Police Department, new chief in town. Now for the last two and a half years, Dallas has been on the news for another reason. We've seen violent crime reduction two years in a row. And this doesn't make news when, when violent crime goes down. When violent crime's up, everyone's talking about it. What's going on? Mm -hmm. When it goes down, people don't talk as much. Yeah. But credit is due here, and that's why we're here with this episode of Yalitik. So first off, congratulations on that. But secondly, how in the world have you done this, Chief? Uh, you know, first of all, I always talk about this and you look around it nationally, right? It starts with support. Mm -hmm. um, I say this constantly. Um, you know, there is no mayor uh, in, the, in America more supportive than public safety than our mayor, than Mayor Johnson. And, you know, I have a great city manager in TC Broadnecks. And then I call him my partner, but my, he's, a, he's my boss, but he's also a partner in John Fortune, who are amazing. And the support that I get from the rest of the city council. And John Fortune's the assistant city manager. John Fortune's the deputy safety. city manager, yeah. And the support that I get from council um, is, you know, if you were to ask other chiefs around the country if they have that type of support, it's amazing. Mm -hmm. um, you couple that with uh, amazing men and women mm -hmm. um, that have bought in, uh, that sacrificed so much. Um, you know, a coach is only as good as his or her team. Um, and we have an amazing team here. Um, but Chief, know. let me hit the numbers here for people who may not realize this. Murders over the last two years down 15%. Um, rape over the last two years down 40%. Tell me if my numbers are wrong here because I know you have them right in front of you and you live these numbers. Robberies over the last two years, they're down uh, almost 30%. And aggravated assault down more than 5% over the last two years. Those are some big numbers. You have double digits in some of these categories here. No, it's it's been it's been it's been it's been a good it's been a good uh, uh, moving the needle is what I like to call it. You know, when we started doing this, well, let me let's back up a little yeah. bit, right? So, coming to Dallas, um, I knew that the mission was going to be to reduce violent crime, right? And, and you know, obviously, obviously, with the the backdrop of also in, increasing community trust, right? Because we got to remember we're just uh, coming out of 2020, which was a very uh, tumultuous year uh, for a lot of cities after uh, the George Floyd. Uh, murder and the protests that uh, that occurred after that in the un in civil unrest and so you had that reduction of violent crime but at the same time you had also you know you have to have your eyes on both right and so teaming up with criminologists from the university of texas of san antonio um you know dr uh, mike smith and dr rob tillier uh to come up with a crime plan because i remember telling him listen i'm going to dallas and let's try to get the best crime plan we can that'll combine like my nearly 30 years of law enforcement with what science has to offer let's put something together before you go on there, what made you decide to do that? Is that common? I, I've never heard of a police chief seeking that data first and kind of finding that partnership and getting the numbers and getting scientists involved. Well, you know, I think we got to get our we got uh, as chiefs, we got to get out of our own way. Oftentimes, uh, leave the egos at the door and recognize we don't know it all. Uh, 30 years of law enforcement. I don't know it all. Um, teaming up with doctors that have 
evidence-based strategies um, is the way to go. Um, and I think we're starting to see more and more chiefs doing that around the country um, with and, regards to. With and did regards they to show that. you things and tell you things that you just went, aha, I would have never put those two things together. Well, it's an interesting point that you make that. So when you look at our crime plan, it's grid work, hotspot policing, which has been around for years and arguably the one science based uh, crime reducing tool that has been shown to work in the last 20, 25 years, if done properly. Hmm. Uh, Place network investigations is the second part uh, of our of our plan, which is fairly new. And then finally, focus deterrence, uh, which has been around for a while as well. It was the fact of bringing them all together uh, that I think made it somewhat unique. Uh, a lot of departments are either doing one, uh, but not all together. Hmm. Um, and so, you know, coming in with that crime plan. But then the other thing that we lose sight of the fact that, man, we were, we were law enforcement was a demoralized profession. Mm. Um, I am not shy. I'm sure you guys have seen it. Uh, our men and women, uh, you know, not just here in Dallas, but across this country, um, had been, had felt, uh, uh, have felt, you know, had felt unsupported. Um, they were made out to be the villain. And I'm talking about honorable men and women, not, not the ones that don't deserve wearing the uniform. I'm talking about the vast majority of officers uh, just felt demoralized. They didn't feel like they were supported. Uh, oftentimes, not just by their chiefs, but by, uh, you know, city administrations. And, you know, so we spent a good part of my first year here trying to build that morale up, letting them know that, hey, it's okay to be a cop again. Um, it's okay. Listen, we have to be righteous at the way, the way we do our jobs. But we got to take the criminal element off our streets, and it's okay to do that, and uh, in a you know, obviously in a procedural just way. And so there is no crime plan that will ever work if if the morale of your department's low. Not not one. It doesn't matter, um, you know. And so we really had to concentrate on that. And so you know, as I go, you know, every once in a while, I'll be talking to different groups around the country about the you know you know the successes of the crime plan, and I'll go, please. Have your finger on the pulse of the morale of your department and don't screw up a perfectly good crime plan hmm. by not checking, not ensuring that that's in place first. Hmm. Because you're going to screw up a good crime plan if you're going to lay it on a foundation of sand because the morale of your men and women is low. Hmm. Uh, can't have it. Let's take apart the crime plan here because hot spots, like you said, have been around for a while. And that's where uh, a department will send concentrated you know, police presence, a number of officers in an area that has a lot of crime. I, you know, we've all lived in different cities. We've heard of this before in different places, but you guys are having success here. And you said a minute ago, if it's done right, it works. How do you do it right? So what we did, we divided the city of Dallas uh, into about a little over 101,000 grids. 101,000. 101,000 grids. Now these grids are 300 by 30 by 300 by 30, right? So it's a little bit bigger than a football field. Hmm. Wow. Because, you know, when looking at the data, it's not the hot spot necessarily. It's the hot spot within the hot spot that you have to uh, really treat. And, and so because of science and because of uh, staffing, uh, we impact about 50 of those. Hmm. Now, 50 out of 101,000 is not a big percentage. I think it's like 0.00. .00 four it's like it's a very low low percentage right 50 out of 101,000 but the interesting part about it is those 50 uh and now to be a grid you have to have led the city in aggravated assault aggravated robbery and murder hmm. so it's not a feather in anyone's cap or neighborhood yeah. to have a grid but what we found is those 50 grids were responsible for a large amount of the violent crime in the city. Nearly, you know, at first it's begun to drop now, but nearly 6 to 10% of that overall violent crime. And just so the, in 50 out of 101,000. Yeah, yeah. Which, which is not one of the things which is not far from what the science says. The science says that it's very few uh, geographical areas and actually very few individuals proportionately that are responsible for a large amount of the violent crime. Like, you know, I say a hundred robberies are not committed by a hundred different people. Hmm. Right. And so you use that context. Right. And so you end up trying to, trying to use data to drive you in the right direction. And so, uh, by, by treating those areas, uh, we've been able to reduce violent crime in the grids anywhere from 40 to 70% in those grids, which then ultimately has had an effect in the city's overall violent crime. Um, you know, I always say this cause I don't want to forget it. Like, you know, this is, we're, you know, we're, this is a violent crime reduction strategy, not a violent crime elimination strategy. Mm. Um, you know, there'll be successes. We've had successes the last two years, but there'll be challenges. 
There'll be times where things will spike up a little bit that we have to treat and bring down. So, you know, it's not a moment in time, right? You know, you look at the last two years, you know, at the end of the year, we've ended up winning the year, even though one life is too many. You know, there were always times throughout those years where things were going up and we got to bring them back down. And could you, so there's successes, but there's going to be challenges. This past January was a little bit like that, where you saw Absolutely. sort of a spike. Does that increase your blood pressure when you've had two <laughs> good years and things are going well? And, and then you have a month where you go, what's happening? Yeah, well, that's when know. he has the Tito's. That's, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, yeah. that's when he goes home. Well, and has I'll those. say this. I mean, I'll, I'll say this, right? So on December 31st, when we, you know, when we reduced crime again, I think I took a deep breath for about a quick second. Hmm. And then I'm like, all right, well, we're back at it January 1, right? There is no light at the end of the tunnel in this profession. There's only another tunnel. Mm. And so on one hand, although obviously there's no panic in us whatsoever, we've been through this before. But um, when we see a month like January occur, you know, you ha really have to take a step back to look what's occurring, right? Our, our, our system is based on reducing incidents. Mm. And so... Every violent incident, we want to try to reduce as many incidents as possible because then that will get us less victims. Unfortunately, in the month of, uh, just in the, in the first part of this year, we had six shootings in the city that were responsible for about 76 victims. Which is stunning. Which is stunning, which is one of those things for, listen, and again, and this is what the criminologists will tell you, like, I can't, we can't control how many people are in the car, how many people are in the house, how many people are in the park. I mean, we can't control that. Um, but what we can control to the to an extent is the incident that could cause the violence. So the the irony is we had the least amount of violent incidents that we've had in five years in January, mm. yet we saw our we saw our victim rate uh, spike up a little bit um, with regards to having people in these particular areas. Mm. And so we look at that, but like anything else, right? Like investments or what have you. We when you invest right, when you've done your homework and you invest right. And you see a blip in the market, right? You know, and as any expert will tell you, listen, I don't know any, I don't know a lot about investment, but okay. I've heard some people say, like, right now is not the time to run. When you did things smart and you did it in the right way, you know that over time it's going to pay dividends. You're pay, playing the long game, and this is exactly here, man. We didn't get into this mess overnight. We're not going to get out of it overnight. We feel very confident, particularly working with our criminologists, by, by reducing the amount of incidents, we will save more lives. And so we stay the course. Well, let me ask about hotspots, though. How do you balance keeping a number of officers in hotspots? And you may have something else pop up over here where you might need two or three officers to respond to. Do, are response times up because you're, you're concentrating officers in one area? And if so, how do you balance that, Chief? Well, two things. So the way we treat them, right, we treat them almost like a call for service. So we treat our hotspots in two ways. Number one, uh, and, and again, we have a weed and seed mentality in our hotspots, right? We're going to weed That's the my criminal. next question. Hold on for the All right, weed and I'll seed. Wait, I'll wait, Hold on, on for the weed and seed. All right, so we treat them in two ways. Number one, like let's say as an example in one of our grids, the high crime areas or three different or four or five different uh, times throughout the day. Well, when those times hit the day, we actually were literally dispatch an officer to go to that hotspot and to be present with their lights in the middle of the hotspot, ensuring they're visible. Hmm. We also have our specialized units in patrol uh, using, using intelligence-led policing to go after uh, you know, the criminal elements and the criminal networks that, that are in that area as well. And so to the extent that it's a call for service, yes, it adds, it adds that, which is one of the reasons we kept them at 50 Grids. Crime grids, yeah. Crime grids. We, we'd love to have more, but I don't want to have a checkbox. I don't want to have 100 grids to say we have 100 grids throughout the city that we can't treat properly because mm -hmm. then it defeats the purpose of the crime plan. And so calls for service, uh, cer certainly our response times have increased. There's no question about it. Uh, obviously, we have to look at the staffing of the department, uh, that we are understaffed uh, for a large department and we need to continue to grow. Uh, there is a staffing crisis in, in the United States. And I'll say that very confidently. We can get into that a little bit later on if you'd like as well. Um, and the reasons why I know that. Uh, but calls for service have increased as our staffing has not, not increased. And so, you know, so basically what I'm saying is there's more on the plate of these officers uh, as it is. Uh, to respond to a lot of a lot of our, uh, our a lot of our calls for service, and so uh, how much I, are response times up? No, response times are, are up. Uh, I don't have the percentages in front of me, but I mean they're 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 up. Our generally what's up more is our priority two calls, right? Our priority one calls we're staying 
uh, pretty decent around what our goal is. Although and priority one's where the, the priority police officer one, has the sirens and lights on. Yes, yeah, so it's the most uh, the most dangerous and most violent type of calls. So that's staying stable. That's staying somewhat stable. We've seen it rise, yeah. but not to the extent that we've seen priority twos, threes, and fours rise. Hmm. Let me. I, I interrupted you again here. No. I'm, I'm cutting you off a lot here, Chief. I no, apologize. No, I got a no lot of worries. questions for you. My no first time all over the here. place. No but but let me. You know what? I, I was doing some research on this, and, and I talked to our uh, fabulous police reporter Rebecca Lopez, um, and, and I said, "Hey, I'm going to talk to Chief Garcia. I need some hard questions for him." Hmm. He's and, and she said, "Well, ask him about this. That you've had success with an apartment complex. I, I don't know where this is located, but she said it has been on the crime grid." For, for years and years and years, and no one has been able to solve the crime at this one apartment complex. She said the chief will know where this is. But finally, you guys have, have been working with violence interrupters. You've had a number of, of officers there, and you finally straightened things out there. That's one real success story in the city and these 50 crime grids that, that is going to have uh, shockwaves, I guess, uh, in the community, right? I, I, absolutely. Uh, 3550 East Overton uh, is exactly where that, hmm. that area was. And it was a crime grid. Where is uh, that? Pleasant Grove? Uh, East o- I don't know where uh, it is. Near, uh, near South Oak Cliff. South Oak Cliff. Yes. I apologize to Pleasant Grove listeners. <laughs> no. Um, but, you know, when we, when we impacted that area, right, it was a grid for like six consecutive grid periods. Hmm. And then finally it was not one. It was no longer even in the top 50. And when I got here, it was, when I told you out of 101,000 grids, we impact the top 50, it was the number one grid out of over 101,000 grids in the city of Dallas. That was the top began. one. The number one. How'd you fix it? Uh, it was a team effort. Uh, obviously, we have to go in and do the best we can to ensure that we take the criminal element out of that area. Uh, I've walked through that neighborhood. There's wonderful residents uh, that live in that area that live in that complex, that would come out and talk to me, that were happy to see us. Hmm. This is why this narrative that gets painted so often is so unfair. Um, but, uh, you know, they were happy that we were there, that we were working together. We brought some violence interrupters in. We worked with uh, the Office of Integrated Public Safety Solutions, uh, code enforcement. So this is that weed and seed you were talking about. Sort this of. is, yes, this yeah. is somewhat of the weed, somewhat of the weed and seed, although hmm. the, the weed and seed has more of a, philosophical meaning for me but but yes it was more of a holistic approach where it wasn't just we're not going to arrest our way into making 3550 east overton safer that's we we need landlords to be held accountable we need to bring code enforcement in um uh, you know do they need parks to play in those kids right do the streets need fixing do they need more lighting um so all that was a part of this uh all of that was the conversation in that yes absolutely and uh and so when we look at that i mean there's some things still that we need to do more um, you know, I'll be honest with you, you look at some, some of our apartment complexes and there's so, there's so many families that live there and so many kids. I mean, it breaks your heart when you drive through there and you see kids playing on abandoned cars. You see kids throwing a basketball against the side of a building because there's nowhere for them to play. I mean, that breaks your heart, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and I've said this, man, when you know, we have to reinvest in people in places, there's no question about it. Uh, but you and I well know, not just here in Dallas, but in this country, there are people that live in hopeless situations. When you live in hopeless situations, you do hopeless things yeah. that then we have to respond to. You know, I say this all the time, and it's become one of my mantras as I have many, but police departments, particularly us, we're the fever reducer. We're the Advil, we're the Tylenol to reduce the fever. But like the bottle says, if the f- fever persists, you need to call your physician. Mm-hmm. We, are, we, are, we, are, we are a tool to treat symptoms, we're not a cure to the illness. And I think, you know, I think as a city, we're recognizing that. Certainly the mayor's recognized that. Certain council has. Our city manager uh, has recognized the fact that we need to reinvest in people and places again. Mm -hmm. Um, And that will make our jobs easier. And so, um, again, you know, I, I use that and when we go into that. So when you look at that holistic approach and try to get that now, it's not going to like we have to stay present. Right. If we can't just leave and it's going to be fine. Right. It's been that I would venture a guess, as my colleagues have told me here, that before I got here, that was probably one of the highest areas for many, many years. Mm-hmm. But it's only one area. Right. There's a lot of those areas throughout the city. And I get like it's like little victories. Right. We have to take one and then move on to the next. Uh, but but we're very proud of that. Uh, we don't want to let it go. Uh, there's more work to be done in that area. There's more work to be done in a lot of other areas in the city. Um, and you know I can't throw my hands in the air and say I don't have enough staffing. Right? Yeah. That doesn't work. You know, we got to continue to figure out how how we can impact 
these areas in a positive way. It struck me that you said that you, that chief. it struck me that you said that you can't um, arrest your way out of these things. Uh, an interesting kind of a weird thing with the numbers is we've been seeing violent crime going down uh, in Dallas in the past couple of years, and yet arrests have also been going down. Uh, they were down almost 20% in 2022. How important is that, that you're not making as many arrests? Well, I think it's a byproduct. We didn't go into this saying we need to make less arrests. That's not what we did, right? I mean, if it the, seems if, counterintuitive, right? Well, if the right individuals need to be taken out of our neighborhoods, then we need to do that. But I think it goes on one of the things that the criminologists found in their year end study. I think it goes to the fact of being data driven that we're not in 150 grids doing we've picked the highest grids that impact the city's overall violent crime the most. Uh, we're driven, intelligence driven for trying to find the actual criminal criminal enterprises and networks and individuals that are responsible for that. Uh, our arrests went down, uh, but our warrant arrests uh, went up. Mm. And so to me, really, it's a byproduct of the fact of being data driven and being focused on who we think are the right areas and the right individuals to treat. Um, and so that's something that, yeah, I mean, uh, to be honest with you, that we, we when we wrote this crime plan, the goal was not let's make less arrests, right? That wasn't the goal of the crime plan. The goal of the crime plan is to save as many lives as possible. But because we're being data driven and because we're being focused in certain areas um, in the city, you know, it's, it's, it's something that came out out of the year report. The criminologists found that, that yeah, we should be very proud of that. We what really doesn't every, Why doesn't every city use criminologists, though? It seems... That, that we have a success here in Dallas that you can show that it, it, it works to, to focus on the numbers. Why isn't everyone running to UTSA or, the, or their local university? You're starting to see more and more. I'll be honest with you. When we started this two years ago and I talked to the criminologists, they had not heard of a lot of departments in this country really using uh, doctors and criminologists to do things. And now it's starting to become more, uh, more of a, I don't say popular, but more of a, Common, I guess? Uh, more, well, more common for certain individuals. I'll say, uh, you know, when you look, I know uh, I get along real well with Chief Noakes in Fort Worth. They, they're they using criminologists in a crime plan. Uh, Chief McManus down in San Antonio, they're using criminologists for a crime plan. I think Troy Finner in Houston, he's also using, uh, uh, you know, uh, criminologists as well. And you look around the country uh, and you're starting to see more and more. I know Salt Lake City's uh, doing a plan. Tacoma's doing a plan. Um, Buffalo. Uh, New York. So it, we're starting to see more and more. And I'm privy to this because being sure. part of the Major City Chiefs Association that I hear from all my colleagues about what they're doing. Uh, but certainly when you look at the staffing issues that we have in American law enforcement right now um, and really in, in Canada as well. Right. I mean, just law enforcement uh, in general, you got to be smarter about what you're doing. But if there's one thing we have found, like if and I, and I testified last year in Senate, and I said the same thing. And I said, you know, we now, we have, we've always known this, right? And you talk about individuals saying that we don't need more police and this and that and the other. I mean, we have a plan that shows that with more staffing and a plan, you absolutely can reduce violent crime. And we have the data to show that. Um, and so I think more and more people, more and more chiefs are leaning that way huh. uh, to use data. Uh, and hopefully, um, you know, we actually just major city chiefs association. We just voted as an association to have uh, a criminologist research body part of major city chiefs as well uh, to really, you know, really start pushing this and really start using science and data. Uh, to move us all forward. So we could see this in, in more cities just because of that, because you're exposing a lot more of these chiefs to this idea. Is this what you tell people when they say, um, you know, what's the secret sauce there, chief? Uh, yeah, I do tell them that. I mean, listen, I don't lose sight of the fact of the fact that, listen, the plan is great, but, you know, I can have the best football play written up. Uh, <laughs> and if the players don't execute it, then I just crumble it up, right? I mean, so again, I cannot tell you how critical is morale of men and women that proudly serve honorably in this in this fight, right? Coupled with communities, you know, again, part of the you know the narrative. Uh, I'm not a stay in the office chief, and whether it was California or here, and you've probably heard me say this before, I have not met one neighborhood in the city of Dallas or when I was in California that was impacted by violent crime, regardless of language spoken, racial makeup or economic status that I have ever heard the words uttered, we want to see less of you in our neighborhood. Never happens. Yeah. 
and I've asked people to come in with me uh, and you can hear my communities. Let me have it. If I'm not, if that, if I'm not providing them with the public safety that they feel they deserve, um, you know, I leave those meetings oftentimes after getting let have it that, that, you know, I treat that as a gift. I mean, particularly, you know, under the narrative that's been going the last few years, right? And I'll say this, we're our own worst enemy, uh, you know, from time to time. What do you mean? Uh, yeah, you know, when you look at incidents like Memphis, mm. as an example, you know, George Floyd, you look at, uh, you know, obviously things that have happened around the country, oftentimes we're our own worst enemy. Do you cringe when you're sitting at home and you see, you know, like what happened in Memphis? Or are you just sitting there going, oh man, this is no, setting all of us back? That, absolutely, absolutely. And, you know, there wasn't a colleague of mine in... In, in, a, in the United States that wasn't doing the same thing. And then so, do you think, do I need to put a memo out to my own people? Is that, does that keep you up at night, the thought that that could happen where you are? Well, we did. I mean, we were very, we, we were very, we communicated with our, with our staff, um, you know, knowing that this was, was happening. I had been in conversations with Chief Davis in Memphis and uh, T- Tennessee Bureau of Investigation and the FBI for a while as they were going through this. So I had a little bit of, uh, of headway that I was able to meet with uh, faith leaders in Dallas uh, and have a conversation about what we were about to see. Uh, spoke to the mayor, spoke to uh, city manager Broadnex, um, and spoke to rank and file. Really, I don't know here's what's coming up, um, and uh, and to and to keep them all looking at that. But but our communities don't want us to go away, um, you know. And and again, I treat the fact that when I go to a community meeting, and it may not be as positive, but it's not positive because they want more. And I always say, hey, listen, I'm going to be a packed community meeting. I'm like, oh, who thinks we could do more as a department? And, you know, you'll see like 90% of people raise their hand and I raise my hand right along with them. Hmm. We wish we could do more too. And so, you know, coming back and telling the rank and file, you know, you know, I remember one of the times when I was out walking around in Dallas and, uh, you know, in some of our areas that were impacted by crime and it was whether or not I, I had a, a conversation in Spanish with a, with a, uh, uh, with a Latina uh, ice cream vendor uh, or an African-American beauty salon owner uh, in an area, they said two things that I brought back to my staff, and this was almost nearly two years, well, about a year and a half ago, and they said, don't forget about us down here, Chief. Hmm. And you would think that's important, but my officers, my men and women, man, oftentimes they listen to what everyone else listens at home, right? And they're working very, very hard on the street. They may not have time all the time to really sit to talk to a business owner or a resident to, to hear those words, so to be able to bring that back to my command staff and go, just please, please remind your folks, we're going to be professional, be righteous, but our communities love us. They want us and they don't want us to go away and they actually want us to do more for them. And that's important to hear. You think it's simple, but it's not simple. Mm-hmm. And it's a message more, more men and women that are on, on the street every day answering calls and uh, trying to reduce violent crime in, ma- in many of our cities, uh, it's a message they need to hear. It's mm-hmm. good to hear that as well. Um, and, and I, I, I know that having, you know, reported on a number of different chiefs here, morale is up here, and, and it's obvious you can tell morale is up. But I want to make an observation for our, our listeners who can't see this. Uh, you've been on the job two years, a, a little bit more than two years. I'm not sure if I've ever seen you in dress blues. Right now, you're wearing a tactical dress out uniform. You have tactical boots on as well too. Um, that reinforces the, the statement you made a moment ago that you're out in the community a lot. You walk the streets, you ride in patrol cars with a lot of your officers. Nothing against your predecessors, but most of them were always seen in dress blues, when, especially when they talked to folks like me and Jason. Um, Jason's usually downstairs with the jailers a lot, but um, <laughs> a, a lot of times, big, you know, big city chief is, is wearing that. But let me, make, let me ask about something else, kind of the elephant in the room here, too. Dallas is a democratic city. It's in a Democratic county. Violent crime is down. Chief, that runs counter to what a lot of elected officials across the country are saying happens in big cities like this and large urban areas. It's, it's an interesting point that you, you know, that you make. And I have an you know, interesting story to, talk, to, to say that that, that that brings it all in a little bit. Um, you know, I come from a place in California, right? One of the biggest differences here is the support that we get here. You know, our communities and our elected leaders hold us accountable. There's no question about it. But there's so much support here for the work that honorable men and women. I come from a place where people, even people that support law enforcement, oftentimes are afraid to stand up and say to support law enforcement. Hmm. And that's and that is, is a fact. You know, I was at, uh, you know, an event in Austin uh, a couple of years ago uh, with Governor Abbott, uh, you know, 
you know, gave a speech and talked about his enormous respect for law enforcement. And as my officer was coming up to get his award, I thanked Governor Abbott. Hey, thank you for those words. I've never heard a governor ever speak like that before. So, and I give this in speeches and paper, people start laughing. And he looks at me and he goes, well, where are you from? <laughs> and this is normally when the laughs start coming. And I go out from California and he looks at me and he smiles and he goes, yeah, we're a little different out here. And, and so one of the things that, you know, that I say is, you know, when you look at to the point you made about the political dynamics here in Dallas, it comes down to common sense. This isn't a red issue or a blue issue. This is a common sense issue. Uh, and, you know, my council members, my city manager, my mayor, they're out there as much as I am. And they know the number one priority here for our residents is to feel safe. Uh, the only way for Dallas to thrive is to be a safe city. Um, you know, we need businesses to invest here in Dallas. We need, you know, we know that there's, when we talk about reinvesting in people and places, uh, there's areas in Dallas that have certain businesses that others don't. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the only way we're going to attract that is by working hard to, 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 to show that, that we're different. Um, and it really just boils down to common sense and to listening to your communities. Um, again, as I said, there's not a neighborhood in Dallas that, that doesn't want us to do more, not one. And the city leaders here hear that. Um, and so to me, I've heard the same things, particularly now, you know, being involved in some of the things going on at the national level. It's not a, this is not a, this is not a, a blue or a red issue. This is a, this is a common sense issue. Um, that if you do it right, um, if you reduce violent crime while still increasing community trust, that's success. That's what we should all want. Um, and so, you know, again, it's an interesting point that you bring. I've taught, I've talked, I talk about that often in speeches that I give that, you know, it, it really comes down to common sense. If you could get the governor for another second and have a word with him, and we know he listens to this podcast, of course he does. Uh, <laughs> what would you say to him? Would you say, hey, you know, uh, you know, we don't have DPS necessarily patrolling the streets of Dallas like they had to do several years back when, when things got really bad before you got here. But what would you ask him for? Could you use their help still in, in, in some areas around town? Well, honestly, what I would ask for is things to assist us in recruiting and retention. Mm. Um, that's what I would ask for. Um, is that more pay for for officers, or what uh, is it? It, you know, it's it could be it it could be a myriad of a myriad of things. It may not just be dollar amounts, right? I mean, I know we're looking for a new academy. Uh, as well. Senator West said he's working on that, by the way. I talked to him the other day for well, an interview. That's fantastic because we need one. But I would say, to be honest with you, uh, you know when they, you know, that old adage, I might screw this up, but, uh, hmm. you know, uh, what's the one where they go, you know, if you uh, uh, give a man a fish, he eats for a day. If yeah. you teach him to fish or whatever, he eats for the rest of his life, right? right? So to me, asking for help, that's the easy way out, right? And don't get me wrong. We could use more staffing, 100%. But to me, let's fix the problem. Uh, and I'll say speech like as an example, like right now, when I talk about this being a national issue, like right now in Washington, D.C., well, first of all, let's back up in President Biden's executive order on policing. One of the top priorities is recruitment and retention. So it, t the president's executive order says that. In addition to that, there's bills right now uh, in Washington, D.C. Uh, being written, uh, bills that I've had to sign off on as being president of major city chiefs, excuse me, to address recruitment and retention. So when I say that there's a staffing crisis in, in public safety and particularly in law enforcement, I mean, it is not just Dallas. It is national. It's a national issue. Hmm. And so I think there's things that, that we can put our heads together to try to fix that or to try to, to help that. Um, but uh, to be honest with you, listen, again, coming from a place where I've never heard a governor uh, show support and speak publicly uh, about law enforcement, uh, to me, I'm just just thankful for his support for the work that our men and women do. So the recruitment and retention thing, though, is it just that enough people don't want the job? Is it that it needs to pay more, have better benefits? What is it? Well, a lot of it is, you know, pay and benefits, obviously. But a lot of it is, uh, you know, let me back up. So last year we hired 200 people. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, is we, that against the 800 that uh, the, the department was down or is that just for attrition, the 200 you guys hired? Well, we were down, I mean, in three years back during the last pension crisis that occurred sure. during those three years, we lost like almost 900 officers yeah. that left. Now, it balanced out a little bit from hiring, but we had like 900 people in three years that decided that they were going to do something else, right? Um, so we're still getting ourselves out of that hole, right? We had a goal of 250 last year, right? Which, again, the support 
uh, from mayor, council, city manager, to be able to hire 250 is tremendous. Mm -hmm. But we hired 200. And like, that's good. Like, I am proud of my recruiting team and that leadership to bring in 200 people, all right? That's, that's good. But we lost something close to 238. So, so is the treading water here. Yeah. So is the problem recruiting or is the problem retention, right? Oftentimes, and I've pushed back a little bit on even some bills coming out of Washington, D.C., that they're concentrating a lot on the recruitment. And I'm like, and I've talked to our folks going, can we, we need to concentrate on the retention part, right? And so uh, we're working on that, uh, working on plans to try to make people, try to entice people to stay longer than the day they become retirement eligible, they don't leave, right? Mm -hmm. So we're working on that. We want to do that. But I'll say this, we have to change our business model. We, we have to look at the business model of policing. And we've always had efficiencies number one. Efficiencies number one, number one, regardless how it affects our people. Hmm. Right? Think about it. If, 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 if you're doing a plan and your efficiency was a 10, but the morale and human cost was a one, people still go for it. Let's go. Let's roll. Right? The efficiencies, we can't do that anymore. We, we have to, within reason, look at some ways where, you know what? On paper, if the efficiency is a seven on paper, but, obvious, but the human cost, and meaning in a positive way, is equal or greater, then I'll may, I believe we'll make up those three points in efficiency hmm. with morale and with men and women wanting to work harder if I can find ways to make their lives here better. So in other words, if it's really efficient for you to put me, an officer, on a split shift and, and make me work these ridiculous hours, uh, you know, it used to be that you would go for that. Uh, a department would go for that. Now you're saying it's more inefficient, but let's let Jason work nine to five uh, several days uh, of the week and have a you know more stable life. Is that what you're talking I, about? I, I mean, obviously... When I talked to within reason, we have to have shift work here, right? right. We're a twenty four seven operation. But yes, in that in that we have to think of ways of, you know, and we're we're going to start looking at that a little bit. Um, you know, as an example, we're gonna we're we're looking at uh, possibly po piloting at one of our stations a four ten uh, schedule, uh, hmm. and what that is a four right? day work week, a four day four hour four four work days ten hour days. Hmm. Um, which since the day I got here, uh, you know, and I had a great rapport with my associations and that's probably the top three things my associations have said to me has been, can we please look at that? Well, you know, I got to put my money where my mouth is. And again, we have to look, it's not all about dollars and cents. Mm -hmm. Um, we have to find ways to, so that our men and women, um, you know, not only is the support important, Right, you look at other cities and other places. The fact that either the support that we get does not go unnoticed, um, you know, does not go unnoticed in certain cities, and so that's huge. That's it. Like you know, people don't look at that, but that that's a huge recruitment and retention tool. As it is knowing that the city leadership here, uh, the mayor, city council, and our city manager absolutely support us. Um, but I have to look at ways with my team and my command staff to go, okay, what, what things can we look at? And the, the piloting that, that shift work is something that, that we're going to do. When will that start? Uh, we're probably going to get some information back here in the next couple of weeks. I'm hoping to start it uh, uh, hopefully by the summer. Uh, to figure out, Actually, I don't want to force people into it, but but uh, you know, and so I'll we'll volunteer for that. Uh, yeah, I'll volunteer for that. Right? I don't now. think you're gonna have to twist too many arms. <laughs> well, or... I would think so. See, I if, when I was in California, that's what we worked. Yeah, uh, we were four ten. That third day off makes a huge difference when you are in a high stress job. It's it makes a huge difference. And I'll tell you this: I got hired in the early '90s. The mm -hmm. number one thing a recruiter told me. The number one thing a recruiter told me was, "You work four tens in patrol," and you're like sold. That was that was the one thing. Wow. Yeah. Um, and 30 so, years ago, and here we are. Talking yeah, about over it thirty now, years yeah. ago. You, now we have to bring it back. Now yeah. I, I get the reasons why we do that, but I will say from and and not only are we doing the four tens as an example, but I guess that's just a an example of how police departments cannot just look at dollars and cents as the reason people are leaving. Hmm. All right, you know, um, and so we need to do what we can to try to find ways to bring it back. Like the mental, the, the our wellness program that we have, right? That's new as well too, don't that, you That's new as well, I'm very proud of that. I mean, four, we, is it four officers that, that call other There's a myriad, that, there's a cadre of officers and all sorts of units that will call that, but we have a d dedicated unit 
uh, of individuals that actually will be very proactive in reaching out and getting officers help. Uh, we've been very successful. I will say we'll be, we've will be we been successful on officers coming forward uh, that feel that they have alcohol dependency issues. And I think uh, we may have our fourth officer that's in the program now. Wow. Um, and we've gotten, you know, I know our units got messages from uh, recruits, uh, significant others that were kind of seeing, you know, like saying, hey, this is great that you guys do this. I mean, that's a recruiting tool. That's mm -hmm. trust and morale right there, Chief. Yeah. I mean, that, that, that just shows that it's working. It's hard well, to come forward with things like that. Well, it is. Well, listen, I say this. To me, it's one of the biggest culture issues that we've had in American law enforcement in the last 30 years. I say this all the time. When I started back in the early 90s, um, if, uh, if I was working with my partner and a call screwed me up, and I turned to my partner, I go, dude, that call really screwed me up. My partner would tell me, you need to suck it up, dude. Mm -hmm. We got to get going. So you internalize then? You internalize it. No, but let me give you the second one. Had I told my supervisor that in the early 90s, my supervisor probably would have said the following words. Maybe this job isn't right for you. Mm. Well, that is, I, I, if anyone was hired, if anyone's been here over 30 years, they will, and they tell you anything different, um, I would be weary of uh, the veracity of what mm -hmm. they're telling you. Because I lived through it, I've seen it uh, with other officers, and and now we're just we're trying to switch that up. Like it's normal, it's okay. Obviously, you're, you're going to have these issues, right? You combine obviously the trauma that this department has been in through seven seven, and you just you add that. That on. was the ambush of the officers yes. downtown yeah, Dallas in 2016. Add, you add that, you know, and I've been told, you know, by by people that I trust here that any officer that was here during that time is struggling. I mean, has, is struggling with something. It's like PTSD. Yeah. I mean, I mean it's 100%. It, it, particularly those that were, you know, in the, in the, in the center and then obviously losing, you know, brothers and sisters. I mean, that, it, it, so that's something that's real to us. It's also a big uh, push that we're doing from major city chiefs perspective, from a national perspective to recognize and realize that how important, uh, you know, uh, the well being of our men and women. If, and, and again, you know, you show me a, a mentally strong, uh, Officer, I'll show you a very happy community member. Yeah, I want. Speaking of well-being of officers, what do you think about what you saw with Austin last weekend with this street racing? Uh, they had viral video of this, and this mob, this crowd, just starts coming at the officers. There, it's real chaos. Uh, what do you think about stuff like that when you see that? It just seems like a total breakdown. Yeah, and Dallas has its own issues of street racing sure. as well, too. So that could happen anywhere, I presume, right, Chief? Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, it could. We we took a, a strong stance uh, we have a we have a, a detail that that deals with street racing uh, and uh, and we take a strong stance on it um, you know what I saw in Austin you know I know those men and women uh, you know I know Chief Chacon uh, he's a friend and a really good man and a great leader uh, and uh, and so I know those men and women uh, are, are trying very very hard to do what they can um, you know obviously when you start seeing uh, individuals with no respect for law and order and no respect, uh, uh, you know, the visions of that police car having to retreat. With uh, fireworks coming with at fireworks, it. fireworks, that, that hurt my heart. Um, you, know, you know, but I will come back and say, those are amazing men and women. That's an amazing police chief down there. The quest, one question I would ask, how is the support that they get? Hmm. Because I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not gonna pretend to know all the issues since you brought Austin up. But the question I would ask is, what support do they get? I don't want to depend on reading Twitter to come up with my own, but it's a fair question to ask. From the city. From what the kind city, of what do support they get? do they get? Um, what support do they get from their DA? That's the oh, cue, Chief. I think that's telling us we're done. I got one last question when that goes off. Oh, that's your phone. I, I, well, you know, it's funny. That was, that, was, that was the Chief's phone, everybody, yeah, in case you heard I, that. I'm sorry. <laughs> who, who was calling, by the way? It was uh, my alarm for... Oh, uh, your next meeting? No. no I'll, I'll, All right. Okay. <laughs> here, I, have, I have a last question for you, Chief. Speaking of Austin, uh, the state legislature's meeting right now, you've been active, you, you, you've met the governor, you've been down there to testify in the past. What, what does the legislature need to do for Dallas PD, for police departments, law enforcement across the state of Texas? You know, one of the things that hits me, and you've, I'm not shy from the, is accountability. Um, is that for activist judges? Is that for police departments? Who is that for? Well, I will say this. Police departments can't be the only entity uh, in the law enforcement uh, arm um, where transparency is demanded. Um, you know, there have been irresponsible decisions made by some judges, not all. I'm not I'm certainly not going to fall into the trap of saying all just like okay. in our profession. But there's right. been irresponsible decisions made by some judges uh, that have allowed violent individuals to go back on the street. 
you know, we don't get to say we're serious about gun violence. And I've said that publicly, and I will say, continue to say, we don't get to say we're serious about gun violence and become outraged on gun violence when we have individuals that are committing violent crime with firearms that are back on the street uh, in a matter of days, if not weeks. Mm -hmm. It absolutely erodes the confidence that our community has, excuse me, in the entire system. And so looking at that, I know there's bills uh, to deal with ankle monitors that do not work, in my opinion, for violent crime uh, Hmm. individuals. Um, And so, uh, you know, I think more from that accountability perspective um, is something that I would like to see. Uh, I I, I probably speak with all my other colleagues around the state that I've had very conversations, particularly with our major cities uh, here in Texas. uh, And then, you know, our local and North Texas cities that accountability is a big part of it. Um, I would like to see. I would like to see some things uh, move in that. Any uh, specific legislation, bail reform, anything? I mean, well, bail ones? bail reform certainly uh, is one is is one that we need to take a, take a look at. Um, obviously, um, will you be down there testifying? Let me ask you that. I don't know. Okay. Um, I don't know if they were to ask. I would. Uh, I'm not shy talking about these type of issues. Yeah. Um, we had criminologists come in to do a study, and then we have an issue. I mean, we have individuals arrested for violent crime that are back out on our streets and I don't think our community, that's what they want. Mm-hmm. Um, and so obviously accountability is something that I'd like to see work uh, in Austin. I think there's, there's, there's appetite for it. Um, and really appetite on both sides as well. Mm-hmm. You know, similar to the issue that we talked about. Um, as usual, Whiteley's last question turned into three. If you didn't <laughs> notice, if you weren't keeping count, They're short question, uh, They're short. I have, I have two final ones here. Two. You were in San Jose, your entire career. You spent 30 years there, climbed all the way to the top and then you retired. And then you decided to take this job. What were you thinking? Like, do you ever look back and and just think, I could have just sailed off into retirement and been out, you know, taking it easy? How did that work out? Well, it's interesting because, you know, two, well, four years now, but two years before I ended up retiring, I was with one of my friends. He was a chief of Charlotte Mecklenburg uh, in uh, North Carolina, Kurt Putney. And I think we were at a conference one day and he were asking, hey, what are we going to do after retirement when we leave? And he was, we were talking about different things or whatever. And I said to him, and this was like four years ago, two years before I retired, I go, you know, if that Dallas job ever opens up, that's something I'd be interested hmm. in. And Kurt would tell you the same thing. Uh, Why, though? Why Dallas? It, it, wasn't, a, yeah, it wasn't in great shape at that time. Yeah, you know what, though? I mean, it's one of those things where I kind of wanted the challenge. Um, and it's a challenge. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> you got your challenge. This, this job is a grind. There's absolutely no, no part of it, but... Obviously, y'all know, like I was a Dallas Cowboy fan before I <laughs> spoke English. I've been to the city many times before. Um, I love the diversity uh, of it. You know, I love that I can be in one corner of the city and have a community meeting in English and then drive immediately after and have one in Spanish. I mean, I love that. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, you know, I just wasn't ready to hang up the cleats yet. Hmm. Uh, but you know what? There's finality to it. Um, you know, obviously I won't be here forever. You know, in this line of work, you want to leave the party early then leave the party late. Hmm. Um, you know, my hours too, chief. Yeah. <laughs> my, my, you know, my job, I've had four goals since I got here. Right. And it's been one to reduce violent crime two to increase community trust three to improve department morale, officer morale. And the last one is to ensure that the next chief of police comes from when this is department. Um, I want sounds to, like that's the last one you got to work on. Yeah. Well, but it, it, I think it's the most, it's one of the a very important one. I mean, I, I'm not going to be here forever. I told when I first got her, I said, I'll be here. I'll be here. I'll, I'll try to be here five years and then we'll reassess, Hmm. um, you know, and now we're two years in. And so, uh, you know, to look, you know, to look at things and to keep working hard, right. I'm going to go as hard as I can. I mean, we talk about taking time off and things of that nature. You don't do that a lot. I don't do that a lot. Um, and seems like you should in a job like this. I've been reminded that I probably should more often than not, but I, I'll, I want to go as hard as I can for as long as I can. And then when I can't go as, if I wake up one day and I go, I can't go as hard as I did a month ago, then it's time to move on. Hmm. You can't do this job. I mean, this, everyone that talks about this, and I hate to say this because I don't want to make being a chief is, I love being a police chief. I, I love the work of the men and women. I love what we can do for our communities. I love the relationships that are built. But anybody that tells you that this job is a marathon, not a sprint, has not done that great. Hmm. Because this is a sprint. And you sprint until you can't sprint anymore. And then you hand the baton off to the next person that needs to sprint. Mm. We are not in a city here where we can just sit back. There is work to do constantly. Mm. And so, you know, again, maybe that's a flaw of mine. 
Um, but you know, when you talk about burnout and, you know, so within reason, I'll try to, you know, to, you know, to recharge them. Everyone has their own ways of recharging. Uh, but yeah, this is sprint. This ain't a marathon. You so, sprint until you can't sprint anymore. Then you hand the baton off to someone else. So that's my last question. Uh, have you, have you been recruited by anybody yeah. else? Does anybody else try to get you to, Hey, why don't you come spend that last five years here instead? Do you, do you get job offers? I mean, when your numbers are good like this, it's got to happen. Your phone has to ring. I, I think people recognize, you know, when those conversations come up that I'm very happy here. So uh, that's a yes then. You but the those, conversations come up. They try. I, I'm just asking, I'm just asking, do they try? Um, I'll, I'm going to go ahead and take the fifth on that. <laughs> I'll tell you what, if I knew my boss was listening to this podcast right. and you asked me if raise. I get job offers from other places, I would say absolutely daily. That's what that last call was on but, my phone that you just yeah, heard. Yeah, but you know what? Honestly, man, I hate to make this, but you know what? I got men and women that believe in what we're doing right now. Um, you know, this is this is a destination spot, right? And regardless, you know, obviously, listen, I'm... I, I won't be, I'm sure I won't be done working after this. Uh, but you know, I'm committed. Uh, they've committed to me. Um, I'm committed to them. Uh, and, uh, and hopefully, you know, everything will continue in the route we're going. We'll have, we'll obviously have challenges. We'll have successes. Uh, but, uh, uh, but yeah, again, like I said, you know, I'll sprint. Uh, you know, one thing I said, I do this job because I enjoy it. If this became, if, if I didn't enjoy it, then it would be time to go. Hmm. Is that fair? That's fair. Well, it's time for us to go on this podcast. Chief, congratulations. Huge, huge numbers here. And we're, uh, we're honored that you had us up on the sixth floor. Jason got to see another floor of the building here. People are going to start believing that if you keep saying <laughs> I, it. I know he's excited about that. But seriously, congratulations. <laughs> and we're going to go find that eight beer. When we do, we'll raise a toast to you. Soon. All right. All right. Awesome. Thanks it's for a real having pleasure. Me. Thank you for uh, having us. my honor. Thank you very much.